Uh, Good afternoon uh, and uh, welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Our uh, schedule has changed a little bit because we were on the uh, floor for um, quite a while today. So we are, um, we're joined by uh, Attorney Eric Patrick of Legislative Council. And so he is going to update us on S30 and the um, Senate uh, proposal of, of amendments. Uh, we will need to decide whether or not to occur with the Senate changes. Um, we won't be making that decision today, but we do need to understand what they did. So good afternoon, Eric, go ahead. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to talk to the committee, as the chair said, about uh, S30, uh, in particular, the, the change uh, that the Senate made. They concurred with one proposal of amendment, which I can explain to the committee, uh, and as well as where it came from, uh, what the basis is for the proposal. Uh, I'm going to pull up the, the language because the easiest thing is the easiest way to, to think about it is to actually view the language itself. So I'm gonna pull that up. And uh, you may recall that the, um, the bill as it, as it left uh, the house, when it passed the house, it included a provision uh, addressing the default proceed firearm sale. You remember that has to do with the, um, with the background check and the uh, default proceed refers to the provision in the federal background check law that has a three day process uh, under which uh, if a person hasn't gotten a positive response yet or if the, if the, um, the firearms dealer who's conducting the background check has not yet received a positive response from NICS, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, then they can proceed with the transaction and, and sell the firearm to the proposed purchaser um, within after the passing of three business days. So, you know, ordinarily, uh, you know, certainly in the vast majority of cases, there is a response very quickly about whether the person is prohibited, uh, you know, because their name may be in one of various databases that NICS is looking at that would prohibit them from possessing a firearm. But if they're unable to get an answer, within those three business days, then the um, dealer, uh, the federal firearms licensee, the FFL, has the discretion to proceed with the sale. Doesn't mean they're required to proceed with the sale, but they may. Uh, that's uh, what's referred to as the default proceed, uh, otherwise known uh, sometimes as the Charleston loophole. Uh, but from a legal perspective, uh, we refer to that as the default proceed. So that's the way that it left. I'm looking at the language right now. You'll see the change that the Senate uh, made is highlighted. The way it left the um, the house was that the default proceed process uh, was uh, amended for purposes of Vermont law by adding the underlying language that you see in sub subsection D here. So you remember the idea was, all right, a firearm transfer is not going to be able to happen unless uh, if the if the transfer requires a background check, then there has to be um, a a positive response from NICS. And that's what that language is that says uh, a unique identification number is provided. That unique identification number is only provided when there's a finding by NICS that the person is not prohibited from possessing a firearm. So in order to get to proceed, uh, there has to be this uh, affirmative finding that the person's not prohibited. Uh, and then, but you had some qualifying language at the end, provided that, and this is the struck language, provided that if the identification number has not been provided within 30 days, then the transfer may proceed. The idea being that, I remember under federal law, there's this three-day default proceed. Um, and the idea was, well, that after 30 days, at least for purposes of Vermont law, the transfer may proceed. But you remember also you had to think about the interplay between this language and a federal uh, regulation, which I'm going to switch to right now. Because under uh, the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives regulations, which I just switched to, uh, and you'll see, I'm going to move down to, and so you see that it refers to what we've just been talking about. There's the, sorry, was somebody had a question? Yeah, yeah. are you trying to share your screen? Because we don't have the shared screen right now. Oh, you don't? No. Huh. 
Uh, well, let me go back to Zoom. Thought I had that. Well, that's important. So you didn't see the language that I just went through? <laughs> I, I think we're fine. We all have a copy of the hard copy of uh, S30, so we probably have that. Oh, that's good at least. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see if this works. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Oh, phew. Thank you. So, uh, having said that about the uh, the 30 days that provision that had been added in the uh, the House version, you'll see there's this uh, ATF regulation uh, in the Code of Federal Regulations, and that provides you know the discussion that you see right there is just what we've just been talking about. That um, you'll see subdivision two in order for the firearm transaction to proceed, Nix has to tell the licensee that there's the proposed person buying it wouldn't be in violation uh, if they possess it. Uh, or there's your default proceed, Roman numeral two right there, or three, three days, business days have passed from the time that they were contacted. So that's uh, another option for the transaction to proceed. That's the default proceed. But then go down to subsection C, time limitation on Nix checks. So this regulation provides a Nix check conducted in accordance with paragraph A may be relied upon by the licensee only for use in a single transaction and for a period not to exceed 30 calendar days from when Nix was initially contacted. The transaction is not completed within the 30 day period. Licensees shall initiate a new Nix check prior to completion of the transfer. So remember, um, uh, the committee discussed this and upon a more detailed examination in the Senate, they um, came to the conclusion that the language of the proposal, that highlighted language, uh, you know, I think it, it was consistent with what was said in, in this committee that the idea was to um, uh, close the default proceed completely. So that, you know, if you think about how that would work, so the, the language says, well, if the defense, if the identification number has not provided with, within 30 days, then the transfer may proceed. But remember the federal regulation you just looked at says that um, if you don't get one within 30 days, then you have to start over. So in other words, as a practical consequence of the interplay of those two things, that would mean that the transaction would not occur until after uh, there was a positive response received from NICS, because if they haven't provided a response within 30 days, even though according to the language in S30, the transfer may proceed, it actually wouldn't be able to proceed because under the federal regulation, it would have to start over. And that would continue to happen uh, until the person was able to get a positive response from NICS that you know they weren't prohibited from possessing a firearm. So the Senate decided rather than have that interplay, you know, let's have the exact same result, but have the language be clear. So, they just struck that 30 day reference completely because I think it was Senator White who mentioned that technically uh, saying that uh, if the identification number has not been provided within 30 days, then the transfer may proceed. That's you know ambiguous because as, as a that may be true as a matter of state law, if this bill passed, then the transfer may proceed under state law, but technically it couldn't proceed because of that federal regulation we just looked at. Um, wouldn't be able to go ahead until they got a positive response. So they said, purposes of clarity, we're gonna strike that completely. And that way uh, the language would read, I think um, uh, effectively doing the same thing that it did when it passed the house, uh, but just more directly, just state that the transfer can't proceed uh, until the licensed dealer gets a unique identification number from NICS. And in, in other words, if NICS doesn't produce a a positive response that the person is not prohibited from possessing a firearm, then the transfer cannot go forward. And that would have been the same effect under the language as it passed the house. It's just clarifying that. So that's the, the only change that the Senate proposed to S30. Otherwise uh, it concurred with, with all the other uh, additional pieces that the house added. I could pull down my screen now, that would be helpful. Any questions? Anybody want to need to see the federal language again? Are people good? 
I guess my my question is: Do we hear from um, uh, Tim? Uh, Tim is it Tim Meehan and uh, Chris Bradley? Did they weigh in on this at all? You mean in the in the Senate side? Yes. On this on this particular change right here, did they weigh in on this? I think uh, yes. I think they they were proposed. Sorry, opposed. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I'd, I'd say at least with respect to Chris, they were they were opposed to this section generally, either with or without the change. I think but I think that's accurate. Um, Barbara? Right. thanks, sir. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, so, Eric, if we didn't make the change. What would remain? I mean, obviously the Senate could, I, I, I get the sort of mechanics, but let's say the Senate concurred. What exactly do you think would possibly lead to a consequence of it being ambiguous? Like, would it go to court? Would somebody's gun sale not go through because it got canceled on the morning of the 30th day and we had in mind midnight on the 30th day or i think yeah it could absolutely be litigated um because of the ambiguity probably would be surprised if it didn't end up in court at some point to try and figure out what whether that meant um whether that phrase you know the transaction may proceed what it must have meant in light of the federal regulation saying it can't. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, that's probably one of the results that would happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Eric? Okay, so we're, we're not going to vote on this today. We've, um, we'll have to report on Thursday. It's unnoticed today, but um, Will is going to ask for um, uh, just to delay one legislative day. And then uh, so we'll do this either tomorrow or. Um, I think that's, that's it. All right, great. Well, thank you, Eric. So you. I'll let you go early because um, I don't think <laughs> 10 minutes is a. Certainly not enough time to do a, to do a walk through. So we're, um, we're going to see if we can get you maybe tomorrow morning or maybe for all the witnesses or something um, to do a walk through of the other bill. Sure. Mm -hmm. Either way, I mean, we, we could start. I know, obviously, you're right. We wouldn't finish the walk through, but we could start now for a few minutes or put it off till the morning, you know, either whatever works better for, for you guys. Yeah. I mean, if, if doing it for eight minutes is, I, if that, if that makes sense in terms of, be walking through, sure. I just <clears throat> so I'm not familiar enough with sort of the flow of it as to whether or not that would be a good idea. But if oh yeah, I mean it maybe it wouldn't hurt. I suppose to uh, sort of give the committee the flavor of it, <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe it's just <laughs> like give give a big picture of. Of what it's attempting to do, and then and then in, in an actual walkthrough, you can go more section by section. Yeah, sure. Yep. Okay, so it is a uh, H four seventy five. And this is part of the um, reclassification. It's, you know, it is property crimes, um, and looking at drug crimes. And uh, these are criminal offenses. That's right. If offenses against the person, uh, you know, a bodily harm, those sorts of offenses. Um, and I think, as you said, I'm sure that in this, because you've already been working with H505, you're sort of a little bit more um, up to speed on the on the topic than maybe you would have been if we were starting fresh with H475. But it's all part and parcel of uh, the bigger picture initiative to establish this criminal classification system. Remember last year, uh, this committee passed and the House passed H87, which was the first bill that started the criminal classification initiative, or at least the first bill 
during this biennium, if I remember correctly, I think it passed in the previous biennium as well, at least, at least partially. And it's an outgrowth of the work of, of legislation that is, has passed this committee over the years, which uh, work that um, uh, the Sentencing Commission has been, has been conducting for several years now to, to try and make the criminal laws in the state more consistent through not only internally consistent with themselves, but consistent statewide in terms of sentencing consistency and other policies uh, of that nature. Uh, the idea being to ultimately have uh, a type of criminal code that the majority of states do have, which right now each offense in Vermont criminal law particularly states its own amount of jail time, its own fine, and states it right within the within the offense itself, whereas the majority of states have a, a uniform code so that you, you use like, for example, which we have in um, H-475, which you looked at in 505 uh, and passed last year in H-87, you know, class A through E felonies, class A through E misdemeanors, as well as A through E, um, and each, a, each, sub, each uh, a through E category has an associated amount of jail time and a maximum amount of jail time and a maximum fine. So each, or unless there's no fine, which there could be, or no jail time, which is also a possibility depending on the category. But the point is that uh, you would then have all the criminal provisions in law, instead of saying, you know, a person who violates this section shall be in prison not more than two years and fine not more than a thousand dollars. They would say a person who violates, you know, this section commits a, you know, class the misdemeanor, whatever it may be. And then you have the penalties are, are listed elsewhere in statute. And ideally it, it provides a way to um, compare penalties more readily to make sure that you, know, you have an idea beforehand, well, how, you know, how much, what's the culpability, what's the severity of this sort of offense? So what makes sense for um, the type of category to fit it into? And you can compare it to other offenses that are in that category. Think about whether it makes sense um, as opposed to you know, it having been done more um, uh, hap uh, haphazardly is the wrong word, but it, it was just done more um, uh, individually over the years without that sort of a code. And there was less of an ability to sort of comparatively think about. And of course, we always made that effort. We try and find it, some other similar offenses when you're thinking about what an appropriate penalty would be for a new crime, for example. But it's certainly not as easily done as it would be as if you had this structure in place um, from the get-go. So that's the idea of establishing, I think, and there's more to it than that, which I think Representative Alon can talk about being on the Sentencing Commission himself, but uh, that's part of, part of what's driving this, I think. And you passed H87 last year, which established these categories uh, that I just mentioned, um, the uh, felony categories A through E, the misdemeanor categories A through E, and um, as well as establishing the categories, H87 last year took all the property crimes and put them into each one of those categories. So, you know, whether it was larceny, embezzlement, those sorts of things, you know, uh, computer fraud, all kinds of fraud, anything that was a property crime. And that sort of uh, may indicate that the way the Sentencing Commission has been going about this, because there's so many criminal offenses on the books, you know, I mean, there's, you know, I think, I'm trying to remember the count we had, I think it was somewhere. Be I'm blanking on whether it was 700 or 900. I think I'm leaning toward 900, but I can't recall exactly. Um, but it's a lot. <laughs> and uh, um, the rather than try and bite them off all at once in one um, one bill, I think what the what the idea is is the Sentencing Commission has been trying to approach it by topic. So last year you did, uh, and Sentencing Commission put forward a proposal for property crimes, and that's what passed the House last year, and that's still down and it's on the wall in Senate Judiciary right now as H87. And what, what H475 does is it takes on a couple of other topics, uh, or sorry, also H505, which you've already been looking at, that's take those the topic of drug offenses. So that was taking drug offenses and fitting those into the, the uh, categories, the classifications. And now H475 takes um, uh, offenses against the person, assault, battery, uh, offenses against the you know, crimes of violence against the person uh, and puts those into the, uh, the classification system. I should add something that uh, I missed that should have been in here is sexual offenses as well 
um, but it's not in the draft of H-475 as introduced, so those will be added. There is a proposal um, from the Sentencing Commission to cover those offenses as well, uh, but those have not yet been integrated into H-475. So, so um, uh, that I will do next. So that would be part of a, probably part of a, a committee amendment. Um, so the version you have in front of you uh, covers, however, all offenses against the person originally had the drug offenses as well, but those were taken out because they were being dealt separately uh, in H505, which I understand the committee has been working on quite a bit. So that's kind of the background of what's gonna be in there and why it's all set up the way it is. Great, Eric, thank you. That was actually very helpful. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, that was great. Uh, okay, well, again, I'm looking at the time and I, I know you have a hard stop. So, so I'm gonna ask folks to write down their questions if they have any um, for when we see Eric tomorrow so we can let him, so we can let him go. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Sure. Thanks for being thanks for being flexible with the scheduling this afternoon. I appreciate it. Yep, you bet. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Yep. Sure. Yep. See ya. Um, yeah, we should. Yeah, let's keep the live stream going. Um, because uh, so uh, so we have quite a bit of testimony on this tomorrow, and um. Trying to see if we can get Eric in maybe, um, I think we have more time than we need at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So maybe Eric can um, do the walkthrough at, at some point, but but actually that his overview was great. And I think if we just, <clears throat> we read the bill, we'll, we'll see having done 87 and 505 that it makes sense. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I will uh, get to Amber the recommendations from the sentencing commission that led to these so that they'll be posted under my name on this bill. Okay, all right. Great, and then Evan Meehan has submitted testimony. Um, he's he's going to be um, testifying tomorrow, but he also has submitted written testimony about their, about their proposed changes. Yes, Amber. Evan, um, is going to let Lori speak? Oh. He did submit written testimony. Okay, thank you for correction. So actually, um, uh, um, our state's attorney will be testifying, not, not Evan. <coughs> discussing um, Evan's uh, written submissions tomorrow. It, is Evan still going to be on on the screen with us or no? Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. So, yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, and then the, uh, the security update uh, will be scheduled for next week um, <coughs> that the, uh, the chief is doing, probably doing a most committees. My understanding. Um, and then I know it's, it's been a long day. Let's just take a few minutes. Um, I'd like to get a sort of a pulse weather report um, on age 631 and actually relating to raising the age of eligibility to marry. Um, since we have a number of us together and Barbara and Coach Tom did need to leave, but just. Um, Generally, um, again, we're not voting today, but uh, generally, are folks okay with it? Not okay? Feel like we've had enough testimony? Need more? Well, we've only heard from one group of people, right? Uh, well, we've heard from credit um, people. I know that Barbara has reached out to some organizations that um, we weren't sure, but we. we to try to think who, who might be opposed to this. Um, and so Barbara did reach out to some organizations and I believe has not heard back. Um, Barbara's shaking her head that she has not heard back. Um, There's no groups out there that oppose to this at all? Not that we've, not that we've heard. I'm not with one of Marissa Flores. I think you'd also want to uh, I think it, they, I mean, I continue to have questions about whether there may be some unintended consequences, but I think those questions were vetted pretty heavily in the Vermont Women's Commission when they looked at this and they tried to, they reach out to a number of groups and tried to identify folks who might be opposed to it. And also I think failed to turn up in opposition. Um, 
So that's allayed some of my mm -hmm. questions of like, you know, what are we not thinking of? Where, right, right. As I've asked questions about it, that's what I've understood is that there was a pretty thorough vetting of in um, the Women's Commission and knowing him forward in opposition at that point there. Okay. It could be useful. I can't remember if Carrie testified or not because I had missed some of the um, first introduction of the bill, but it, it might be. I know I'm thinking a um, valuable witness. To this I other think process. did, but we may have, I have to check. We may have testimony but i will um i'll check and if she has not then yeah thank you um I'll, i will reach out to to her so that's a thank you that's a big question mark okay yeah i think uh my only preservation at this point is that we haven't heard any opposition and whether it's that because there isn't any or there isn't any coming forward um but i think there's there's more than enough compelling argument to really consider the change. Um, and I'm, I kind of get the same digging into not commission on women, their work on this and looking for the unintended consequences. I haven't really stumbled across any. Um, so, so far, I definitely want to hear if there's anybody else on the bill um, that we should be hearing from. And considerations we should be making, but the initiative has has my nice support going forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, I'll say yeah. I share the concerns I already expressed with unintended consequences because it seems as though uh, this was a a learning experience, or there weren't unexpected things in other states. But I, I feel like you know we're not the first to to, to look into this. I feel like we can uh, sort of build off what's been done before. Yeah, I I feel comfortable with the idea of the. Bill moving or the bill moving forward at this point, I certainly could support it. I feel like, you know, the it's been looked at very thoroughly. Um, I, I feel like we've got a good handle on what the potential outcomes would be. Um, we've heard very strong support from it from the group who's involved. And you know, and and, and as been mentioned, we haven't heard from people who are opposed. And are they out there? Maybe. But I have to perfectly admit, we we heard testimony that the vast majority of these instances of child marriage are, are, you know, girls, you know, teenage girls marrying adult men. And, and quite frankly, I don't, if there's some, you know, adult dude that wants to come in and argue for his right to marry a 16 year old, I'm not certain I need to hear his point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Okay. I can appreciate that. That's a question at yeah. the risk of like going down the rabbit hole of hypotheticals. Yeah. So here's the only <clears throat> hypothetical that comes to mind. Let's say you have a young person under the age of 18. Let's say you have a 17 year old who is with another 17 year old and has a child. I'm just going to go down this road of hypotheticals for a moment. So we know that in our current system, marriage provides financial incentive in our tax structure and whatnot. <clears throat> Often young people having children are in financially vulnerable situations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, is there a hypothetical scenario involving young people um, where they might have a family unit and not have access to marriage that would provide them with certain financial securities that others would have? Never know marriage to save you money. And so they would they would want access, they would want a parent to apply for them to be married. They would want access to the law. Is that what you're thinking? That yeah, like if they if if they would want to be married, my understanding is they would they would not be allowed to be under this law. Unless a parent signed. Yeah, I I don't like I don't know about that hypothetical like. If I can kind uh, of back that around for a second, is there more potential harm in letting them marry early than there is financial harm in not letting them marry? If we're going to weigh that out in the hypothetical, and then is there a remedy to that that doesn't involve some of the methods of kind of manipulation or abuse that we've heard testimony on? I 
respectfully. All parents don't think that parents should consent for children in that situation. I think that leads to some really gross situations which we've heard testimony about. But one thing that we used to have in Vermont law that I think we took out and we heard testimony about was um, a judge permitting the marriage. Right, probate court. Yeah. That, that we repealed. Yeah, Michelle did discuss if that with us. Put, I'm, I'm not wildly comfortable with it. Like in that situation, you could say with prevailing circumstances, such an age could appeal to a court. So they have an avenue, but it's it's between like the court representing the state's interest and protecting youth and the youth themselves and parents need not apply to that situation. <laughs> yeah, I, but I think it would have to be like between two youth and, and with the judge if it's below the age of majority, just because there is such avenue for misuse of of, of that, I think we've heard, and that makes me nervous, but I want to, like, presenting a hypothetical, I wanted to present a hypothetical solution. I hope that's in line with what you're hoping. <laughs> yeah, we, can, we can ask Michelle, um, you know, about any legislative history as to why it was repealed, why the, why the ability to go to a judge um, to be married was, was taken out. That would be helpful. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily advocating for anything in particular. I think it just comes to mind for me. Okay, okay. thank you. And I'm looking at Perry Brown now to see if she. But any, anyone else? So, okay. have we specifically heard from the uh, Commission on Women? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the committee yeah. Is it uh yeah, right. yeah. Carrie Brown equity um yes on January twenty eighth that's right oh yeah she actually she uses a really great um tool um equity impact assessment tool so but did she testify or not I, in person she because that's that's not really a, is that saying that they support this or not uh. I would, I would I have a, refresh my memory. Yeah. Um, they definitely worked on on the concept a bunch, I know. Okay. Especially okay. about it. So she could, I think she could be interviewed. They did give testimony in the Women's Caucus in support of the bill and gave some okay. really, really good data points. So I might be completing testimony here with testimony received elsewhere. And I do apologize if I've. No, I see that this is also yeah, positive. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, um, take, we should take a look at it. It's quite, quite detailed. So, um, all right. Well, I can uh, get in touch with Michelle and see if she can answer that question. And uh, take, it, take it from there. Anybody else before we adjourn? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.